You're listening to Adventuring Party for the third week of July 2024. This week, are you frustrated? The party are too, and ranting about it is probably the same as helping. The Adventuring Party discussing tabletop radio gaming the Irish way. Welcome to the party. I'm Warlord Scar, tireless uh, reducer of hit point totals. And I'm Dave. And we're here to tell you. We're here today to talk about when the combat in your RPG just gets a little bit... Uh, yeah, we've all been there, I think. Yeah. A lot of uh, combats... like You're going to get all kinds of uh, uh, opinions about combat in RPGs. Some people just say, oh, bad all combat, narrative, consequences for everything. But, you know, narrative is... A, uh, sorry. Combat is a very engaging part of most games, and I don't think it's going to go anywhere. And usually in most games, it goes reasonably well most of the times. But you're always going to get those fights. At a certain point, whether it's because of mechanics or it's because of the setup, uh, you're going to get those situations where things are starting to drag or just not going the way you know you're hoping and it can really put a damper on an evening's uh gaming uh i recently had a situation in a game where a uh, high level party of uh dnds adventures wandering around this dungeon and they find a room full of trolls first to think oh it's like oh it's three trolls cool we'll just uh, beat them up and then set them on fire there it'll be fine and then the other seven trolls came out of the room. And all of a sudden, you've got like 10 of these things coming out of the room. So these are like 50 hit points and regaining five hit points this turn. And the party are just looking at this, is just looking through their lists of magic games, saying, I don't have any fireballs here. And now we're facing down this situation of, oh, well, I guess we just have to pick one troll, beat it to death. Casey one of us has to stab it again to stop getting back up and then just grind through these trolls as they're continually healing and then lightly mauling us because they're such high level that most party members are basically never going to get hit. And it's just... You, you, as a GM, you're very quickly staring in the barrel of, oh, this is going to be like a 10-round fight. And like every time they... That even every time they miss an uh, attack, whatever, every time they roll low for damage and then it's the the uh, the trolls go and they heal all their hit points back. And so eventually it got to the point where they they had like just enough fire spells. They pointed them at the biggest and meanest troll. And I kept rolling morale chest because fire is the one thing trolls are, fair, are afraid of. And I, I finally troll fails morale check with two hit points left and the, the trolls mostly let. And I was just like, was that tremendously realistic? Uh, it, it was for the good of the game, I think, to, to say, yeah, let's take this result as opposed to the long, drawn-out result. And then the next session was an entertaining romp. Uh, they, went around the, they went around the dungeon looking for fire magic or other, some other way to stop the trolls from attacking them again so they could get into the room and uh, get what they wanted. And that was fine, but the session before that, there was just this looming cloud of dread over the whole proceedings as you're, you, you're looking for an out to uh, get past this uh, long, sloggy piece of work. I mean, that, uh, yeah, I, I can see that. Uh, it's a lot, you know, I mean, regenerating enemies can be a little frustrating at the best of times, but... I'm curious to, to, to kind of look at what actually went awry there, like the mechanics, the setup, player like player decisions. I assume it's it's mainly just this module was set up with the assumption that it's going to be this high level party of typical A D and D uh, adventures and the assumption is that either they're going to have a wand of fireballs that there or some other resource of fire magic that they can you know, focus down the trolls quickly enough while presumably a whole bunch of hirelings get mauled to death protecting the wizards. Or module designer assumed, okay, this is an optional part of the dungeon. 
you don't need to worry about it. So it's okay if uh, the player party can't fight these trolls. They'll just have to work around them, which is fine, but like not very helpful in the moment when the, the players have using using their weird combination of Ponzi scheme and uh, um, knife salesmanship uh, had tricked their way into the room to try to negotiate the trolls before starting the fight. The, the, the module designer can make assumptions about the situation and say what's most likely to happen, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee things are going to go in a certain way. Yeah, yeah, I, I can hear that. I, sometimes it is a mechanics issue. Yeah, like I'd say there's also just mechanics of, because they're using an early D&D inspired system, player damage is relatively constrained. Like they've gotten way stronger over the course of the things, but they're still rarely doing more than 10 damage a turn. And that and, and, and that's fine if they're fighting a couple of monsters, they can uh, grind down one or two of the monsters each turn. That works fine, but when when the trolls are basically keeping everyone apart and they're not able to focus properly and this and that, it becomes a, a different procedure. Uh, it does sound very grindy, uh, unfortunately so. Uh, another example, like another set of examples that comes to mind are the uh, the Warhammer 40k uh, D100 RPGs, uh, where I like. A lot of them had uh, ev- evasion rolls that were based, you know, like based on dodge or parry uh, in the later systems, and they could entirely negate an attack. And yeah, that that's that's quick to resolve, absolutely. But it also means, uh, all right, so you could have you like you could have uh, situations where you know, tra- you know, like veteran space marines are you know like. You know, with huge weapon skills or ballistic skills or launchy attacks, and those attacks are always missing because, like the you know the the you know enemies are, have, well they 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 keep making their dodge rolls. And I I did notice a uh, Dark Heresy Second Edition brought in talents that brought big pe- brought uh, penalties to uh, dodge uh, you know for um as as talents. So, uh, you know, for single attack, so a sniper could actually have a decent chance of, uh, or a sharpshooter could have a decent chance of uh, landing hits in combat as with their one attack a turn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and th- this is sort of a development uh, in, throughout the the life cycle of uh, the forty K RPGs, where they start off, you know, as I said, with this slow like. As high level uh, players got up and they started having multiple attacks, and then you would get the counterbalance of multiple dodges or multiple parries a turn, and then as the power level escalated o- uh, over the course of the thing, that became those became go to talents, and therefore at a certain level you would just have, well, I swing at you three times, well, I dodge three times, or figure out different ways to try to wear down someone's reactions or take them completely by surprise. So, you know, to avoid very Dragon Ball Z things where, like, there's a a hundred punches going around the battlefield, but no one's really being hurt. Yeah, it's not great if you get a few rounds of uh, swing, miss, shoot, miss. Uh, You know, going back and forth because the PCs are also going to have decent, you know, ways to to negate attacks yeah yeah and considering how deadly combat could be in those games you understand why people build characters that way but it's still you still get this frustrating uh, point of well the enemy has to be made built sensibly and the players are built sensibly and all these very sensibly built characters are just like two rubber balls bouncing off each other and do we want that are we are we are we looking for those times where you know I I roll I roll my like eleven on my one hundred and twenty six weapon skill and the finally after ten turns the the dark elder warlord finally rolls a ninety three in their dodge and actually takes a wound and explodes is is that the place that we want 
And I don't think they did because, as we've seen, as we've passed over to the uh, Imperium Maledictum. That's the name of the Reptile Wolves company. Oh, but, yeah. yes. They have their, you know, their Age of Sigmar and uh, Wrath and Glory system, uh, which is very much more based around mowing down enemies uh, in spades. Uh, but when they re- we invited the D100 systems, they, there's a much bigger emphasis on opposed roles. So instead of having someone having uh, 10 attacks, they're going to have one attack, but it's generally going to be higher baseline than the equivalent character in previous iterations. And then it would be compared against dodge roll or reaction roll uh, of the enemy. And it's the comparison between those so you don't get a situation where the person with 90 weapon skill can't hit the person with 50 weapon skill because they just get keep get rolling well in their parry checks. You Now it is, well, I have a plus 40 advantage, so I'm almost definitely either going to score clean hits or I'm going to build up so much advantage using advanced systems uh, from Woofra uh, that I just push through, uh, push through a perfect hit and end this fight. But yeah, that's sort of... Uh, that's a mechanical issue that was developed over the course of, and let's not be let's be real here that this is coming on twenty years since Dark Heresy was first released. So, you know, that's game design in a nutshell. I do think it's interesting that we're both um, noticing this problems in what I might call older iterations of games that had a different paradigm, as it were. Eventually, it, the combat issues over. Multiple ga- multiple different games, multiple different scenarios. The combat issues with 40k have been with the 40k and Wolf of RPGs has been improved to a place where uh, the modern designers are much happier with it. But here's me looking back at a more old school uh, game system. It's unclear what the intended exit strategy for a frustrating combat was, because these games tend to have higher, harder runaway rules or unless you're like building up potions and wands uh, or other go big explosion um blow out we have to win this fight otherwise it'll take all evening mechanics if you don't have those then very often the US gem will be sitting there looking at your fearless trolls you know, not in the side, but worried about having their heads cut off. And the players will be looking at the card sheets of uh, perfectly op- op- optimized for non healing, non healing monsters, and like basically you staring at them and them staring at you, and each side hoping that some genius solution will come out of the, uh, out of the ether. But you sometimes you just have to take the take the reins and just sort of declare, well, okay, I'm going to start rolling fear checks every time they they remember that they have, like, two fire spells. Which also sounds less than ideal. Again, a lot of these th- problems, I feel, wouldn't have been as much problems for a, you know, a typical, quote-unquote, party of, of, the, of the situation. Because, you know, a, a, an older, like, a 1970s, 1980s party... A would have invested more in having a balanced set of tools to deal with common encounters. They would have made sure that their wizard had some scrolls of fireball or that they had ability to like build a barrier and just pour flaming oil on top of the trolls or something like that. Uh, where which where a modern party more used to just sort of jumping in both feet first might not have had that strategy. The other problem was, again, there wasn't this expectation that every piece of the dungeon was mandatory. There was just a, this this section is the troll section. There is X thousand gold pieces or X mazerams or whatever in there. And if they really, really want, they can have the big grindy combat with the trolls. or But otherwise, they can just move along and find the, the rest of the dungeon. There wasn't a, a assumption of you know having to complete everything at that that paradigm isn't something that people back then thought to communicate because it was so very obvious to them. Although obviously you don't have to create all the dungeon. That would make no sense. 
so they never, you know, brought in into things of like, well, what are they? What are the players are used to doing everything that's in front of them? Yeah, I mean, you're, you know, if you're used to clearing out entire levels and entire dungeons, why wouldn't you do do that? Like, I mean, I've had similar issues with uh, other D and D games in the past. Um, actually, not just D and D. A lot of Savage Worlds has this problem too. So I'm talking about the thing where uh, frustrating when the enemies are too tough or too tanky or too evasive or what have you. And the the slippery nature of the slippery nature of the combat or you can't really engage with with how to find a mechanic solution very efficiently so you end up sort of looking around for non mechanic solution. But then there's uh, the uh, inverse problem where let's just say the well I shot I I, I shot the villain in the head. I, I I got the first initiative. I shoot the villain in the head, and uh, they've crit failed all their damage soak rolls, and that's half the fight gone. Oh well, I guess it's not going to be ent- evening and entertainment as as you swashbuck around this uh, cool set piece. I guess the boss is dead, and everyone runs away. Like I said, this has happened. This happens a lot in D anD D if you have enough rogues in your party. It's not as bad because D and D you can generally say, well, there's like ten more monsters in the in the next uh, next room. It's not bad unless it happens literally every time. It can suck a bit when your wizard bad guy dies, but you know generally there'd be still something interesting to happen in, in your typical dungeon or scenario or what have you. But I uh, one place I saw it happen a lot is a Savage Worlds. Uh, where if people don't know Savage Worlds, it has uh, essentially you roll a damage roll versus an enemy's toughness. A- an important enemy will have bennies to try to mitigate damage based on your success levels. You'll notice it happening a lot where right before an a, 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 a enemy is going to do something big, uh, the player, a player you weren't expecting will just roll a massive roll because of exploding dice and you're look facing down the barrel of you know this enemy being maybe not knocked out or just reduced to like minus two wounds putting penalties to everything they do and you can all of a sudden you can't roll uh, a soak to save your life and you know you you look down this limited pile of bennies it's like do i I keep trying to spend all these bennies uh, on say this guy, or does that feel a bit cheap? In in one sense, it's not a problem for your your bad guys to inexplicably get bennied from every uh, every bullet that that comes at them because you, you have a stack of poker chips in front of you and you are spending them like crazy. So the players always have a view of assuming you're at the table, I suppose. They always have a view of oh yeah, now we are getting through this guy's defenses. Uh, we are waiting down, but sometimes the dice are just not on your side, and or a uh, run of bad luck earlier or something. You you end up with not a lot of resources there. Uh, you just can't roll, and you come down and just this lucky, this one lucky roll from a player, unlucky on your part, left you basically without a fight. And I mean, in some cases, you can say, well, that's the problem with the fight. You didn't set it up. Well, well enough to uh, continue without this pivotal creature, but boss fights or you know fights against uh, cool characters are like such a staple of fiction, and particularly of the pulp fiction that uh, Savage Worlds are trying to emulate. You know, it's very hard to avoid falling into a situation where yeah, there's one big uh, character in the middle of the enemy formation. And it doesn't feel bad to be, it doesn't feel that particularly great to be constantly saying, well, yes, you have a super boss character, but also they're in cover and they have like three bodyguards next to them and, you know, they have sniper support or something. You know, you don't want to feel it set up too contrived because are you, are you, yeah, I guess it's a question of like how much design, kind of design should be going in uh, to every fight and like not everyone is infant prep time. So and again, a lot of a lot of comic characters will be pseudo spontaneous. You just things will work out in a certain way where a, a a 
then you see that you thought it was going to be one place, it's going to be another place, or the players could just stumble across them at a time we weren't expecting. So you don't always have perfect encounter design capability. Yeah, no, like, you also can't anticipate how how parties will be... You can't always anticipate how parties will be arranged, like, like your example of um, assumptions about... Um, Old school, D- an old school adventure where which could have been written decades before you you played it. Yeah, exactly. Like I, I'm using a modern OSR game, uh, World's Life Number, uh, but it has very different assumptions about how much uh, magical output the the uh, a typical spellcaster will have uh, compared to D and D, where there was a sort of vague understanding that by level seven. The, the players would move heaven and earth to have enough resources to take on most situations, whereas this is this is more explicitly Vancean, uh, for order, like as in the fiction of Jack Vance, where the protagonist's resources are more limited and the things they're fighting are a bit less expected. So while I'd say the party is relatively well clipped, they don't have an, a wand of fireballs is something they aren't going to just find on a treasure table somewhere. It's going to depend on what they find in the dungeons. And again, there's also the the older edition assumed that they would be scraping the, uh, the dungeon for all kinds of magical goodies or trading them with their NPCs or something. But that generally hasn't happened as much in this game. So... Yeah, no, there wouldn't be there wouldn't be multi- many multiple adventuring parties who you could oh yeah like you you've such and such we've such and such let's swap. Yeah, like these are things I could have changed as we're going through the game, but I didn't foresee this particular room of trolls as something that I needed to you know dangle one of the fireballs in front of them ten sessions ago. Yeah, like it, the gems are not in fact omniscient. Yeah. I mean, if we're going to go into advice on this, I guess planning ahead is always good, but all planning has limits. So it does pay to go ahead and just try to check ahead to see, to just think through a given encounter and say, is this going to be a problem? As a GM, possibly you should be reviewing your player's character sheets every level or two just to say, well, where do we actually stand? As opposed to finding out mid combat, oh, they have nothing to deal with this monster, oh, or or they have so many solutions to this monster, there was no point in even bringing it up. If you're using, and this is the thing is, that if you're using uh, pre arranged modules, do a sanity check on what's the most likely way to they're going to go. There's always so much that you can do. Like the dungeon I'm running them through has got so many different ways through it that I didn't feel there was any uh, any real way to predict which monsters they were going to run into. Uh, which, now that they're four levels deep in the dungeon, I say, oh, wait, there's actually a very obvious main path through this dungeon that I just didn't notice before. And they, they managed to basically take that one, and it takes them right past the troll room. Huh. I think about that. Well, they don't have to explore the entire dungeon. They don't have to clear out every room. Yeah, yeah. I guess that's Another thing is you you should be checking the assumptions of your game to make sure that uh, you're all on board with it, um, and you're not you're you're not falling into a situation which the game designer could not have anticipated, or scenario writer, or what have you. For your self design issues, where you set things up yourself, it does really help to. You don't have to like prep for every eventuality. That way lies madness, obviously, but. It does help to know your situation and know what your characters are doing, what they're about, what their limits are, so that if you do uh, you end up with uh, the Dark Lord gets shot in the face with a, an arrow and kills over dead, what are the orcs and the uh, ghouls going to do about it? I guess part of the thing about frustration is it's a feeling and you can't completely control your feelings, obviously, but you can control how you react to them. So, you know, there's a certain level of take your lumps, but also steel yourself against the situation and see what you can do about it. 
you know, we all feel the DM process when you're in the middle of, you know, your five rounds of your combat and you're realizing, oh, wait, this is going to be slug or, oh, no, this is all going to fall apart in two seconds and, you know, an evening's, con- an evening's content is going to last 10 minutes. When you're in that situation, there, you can't refer back to mechanics or not only to a certain extent can you refer back to, con- to oh, the mechanics are designed this particular way. It's not, not it's kind of annoying. Or, uh, oh, the mechanics are this particular uh, they set up the scenarios a certain way, so can't really change it. If the table is getting frustrated at a certain scenario or something, that's something you're going to have to work with with the table to solve. If it's you in particular is getting frustrated, then the thing that needs to be designed designed around is you. If you're sad that your bosses are failing so badly, um, you're getting ganked all the time. You're probably going to have to uh, change your approach, make less boss centric thing, more more golems that go that go crazy when their wizard is killed. Uh, minions, minions are good. Soak up some hits. Minions, lieutenants, two big ogre brothers swinging the same axe. You know, as opposed to having you know all your eggs in one basket. Think about di- like. You're going to have some boss fights, and some of them are going to go anticlimactically. Although the players might be very happy that they did not have to fight Gargon, the Death Toucher. So it's going to be about managing the feelings both that you have and that your table have. And again, you can spread the load. You know, you're not alone in this table. Yeah, absolutely. If in doubt, you you can change things. Yeah, you can change things, and you're going to get these frustrating moments. The main thing is getting through them, and then getting on to what you love. As I said, there was a happy ending to my Room Full of Trolls scenario where they had a wonderful conversation and light beating session with a fire giant and convinced him to basically lock the trolls in their room, sneak past and and get into their objective and save their dashing uh, buddy. And uh, that all went well in the end so you know when you're deep in the throes of oh this is such annoying or oh they killed him so easily like there might be payoff yeah I think you can very easily make the best of it like it's frustrating in the moment but you can get through that moment you can then work the payoff and I do think like one of the uh, big things is uh, after the troll fight that was pretty much the end of the session so then I had next week to go and come back into a much more dynamic thing with, you know, a fire giant and a succubus and a hellhound wrangling. It does sound more interested than, than grinding a sleep. Yeah, yeah. So don't lose hope, as I guess what, what I'm saying. Things like you go going to get a solution. You might just need 10 minutes to think on it, or you might need a, a week between sessions. You, you say this. You know, don't be afraid if you absolutely are up, driven up a wall or thing. It's never a terribly bad to end a session a little bit early, uh, so that you can have, you can you know have a week or whatever to prep the next thing. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I I've been thrown for a loop here. Need to need to work on it. It's always a valid reason. Yeah, uh, like the, like telling your players, uh, oh, I need I need a bit to fi- figure out this next part. It's not going to kill the magic, you know. They they understand. They're they're reasonable folk. Yes, reasonable. <laughs> well, to an extent. And again, you can look at how you like. If these things are happening constantly and they're really starting to get to you, then you can take a look at uh, what about your play running style is causing. Maybe maybe it's a mismatch. Yeah, there's a mismatch somewhere. Maybe it's your players. Uh, fighting style where they do not particularly want to you know think outside the box and they do want to just uh roll dice and kill goblins mm-hmm. maybe it's that you're too over reliant on big single bosses and um you know it, your scenarios fall apart if you don't have one or it gets killed in round one or if this is constantly happening or maybe maybe it's just mechanics you're a system that encourages either really grindy or really unsatisfying combat. Maybe you need house rules or maybe you need to change systems. All these are possible, but it's the willingness to look into it and think, oh, 
try this, try this. Try a few different things and see. I'll encourage players to try things as well. Like, is it, maybe the, the problem isn't you know, what you're doing, it's the approach. Yeah. Feed your players with, again, it's not illegal to hint at your players that maybe maybe they can run off and find a uh, scroll of fireball somewhere else before going, you know, through this room. Or, you know, or many flasks of oil in a torch. Yeah, exactly. Oh god, the finding all you're finding in my game is going to be, get very interesting very quickly. Yeah, so uh, the troll population is falling rapidly. Who knew? Funny that. Funny that. Well, yes, if you found uh, us frustrating and would like some exploits so that you can get past this podcast, you could probably find it on our Discord. There's a lot of very uh, important people, very, very cognizant of the mechanics of a podcast and how to exploit it. Or you can hit us up on our other social media and see all the other wonderful and annoying things we have to say. Yeah, uh, absolutely. But for now, this party is over. Thanks for listening to The Adventure Party. You can find show notes and links to things we've mentioned at www.theadventuringparty.net and on our Facebook page. You can leave comments there or talk to our Twitter account at AdventurePTY or you can record a voice message at www.speakpipe.com slash theadventuringparty. We can also be contacted directly by email at party at theadventuringparty.net. If you'd like to be in touch with the party all the time, come join our Discord server. Link in the show notes. The Adventure Party is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike of Version 3 License.